So I think um, as a point of clarification, it's not necessarily that the rights come from the state. It's more that the security of rights comes from the state. The security, yeah. What, yeah, the rights themselves are discovered by the Indian society through essentially, well, I mean, this, this is actually an interesting conversation. So um, the concept of a right to life is discovered through an experience that, that stretches all the way back to the foundation of um, any any community. Now, every single community has its own founding myths. You know, there's um, in Greek, there's autochthony. In in Rome, there's the whole idea of uh, Remus and Romulus. In Christianity, obviously, it goes all the way back to to Adam and Eve. But the idea of say necessarily the free the, the right to life in the Christian doctrine, and this is what I understand. So, I'm apologies if it's wrong largely comes from the the violation of um the, the the covenant in cain and abel now when when you know um when when is it cain that kills abel i can never remember which way around it is when i can't remember whoever, either <laughs> whoever kills who it's, yeah. it's it's a violation it's felt to be a violation and it's reinforced through christian doctrine all the way so when you have the um, scientific revolution that essentially takes away um, the the Christian reason for it. It's it's not necessarily that the right is you know deduced from um, just complete abstract thinking. It's rather that the history of Christendom in the West influences our very capacity of thinking about rights. So when people claim that the right to life is an essential right. Personally, I think that's because of the history of Christianity in the West. You can't do without it. And, and that was always going to be the case. So um, my answer in terms of, you know, the, the, the decline of Christianity and its relationship to, I think the, the, the lack of an authority is certainly visible. Um, but again, part of what Aditi talks about is this kind of erosion of authority. And it's something conservatives are very concerned about in the entirety of the 20th century, the decline of deference and the death of authority mm -hmm. and all these things. With regards to rights inflation, so again, Roger Scruton talks about this a lot. You claim your right by virtue of being human. And and, and that's, you know, that's, that's all very well and good, human rights and all the rest. But if you can claim any right as a human right, who is there to tell you that you can't? Now that's yeah. you know that that's kind of a dangerous ground to tread on because on the one hand you've got acceptable rights and rights that are recognizable as universal and that's what the basis of rights ought to be. The problem is that there are then particular rights, rights that are claimed by unique societies that emerge only out of cultural circumstances. That are then claimed to be his, uh, human. Take the instance of, for instance, the human right to abortion. The idea of a human right to abortion is absurd because it can only ever be women that have an abortion. It can't be all of humanity. So it's not a universalizable right. It can be a privilege and it can by all means be a privilege that has grown up in a cultural institution. But you have to recognize that it's a culturally rooted privilege. It's not a right. So I agree in, in the sense that, you know, there's a decline of authority, especially with regards to Christianity, that has led to a certain rights inflation. That isn't inherently a problem, provided there's an authority that can replace God. And that's essentially what Nietzsche was talking about at the end of the 19th century. God is dead. We need something to replace him. And, and I'm not going to go into Nietzschean philosophy here. But essentially, we didn't. I we love didn't really philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people do because he's, he's yeah. a very interesting thinker. But the, the issue is that we didn't really replace God. There was no kind of universal authority. And as a result, it became a very particularized authority. And that authority tended to be the state. So rather than, you know, this, this universal authority, it became an authority in a particular area. So it was a fusion of the secular and temple, temporal, which had existed uh, as, as separately for, for two millennia. So, so now you can only ever claim things through the state. You can't claim them through an authority external to the state. And if the only way you can claim things is through the state, then the state becomes the ultimate arbiter in any possible discussion around these things.
And if the state is the only possible arbiter, then the state is the only one that can tell the state if it's right or wrong. And of course, the state is always going to say that the state is right. Mm. So you end up in this circumstance where through our very desire to push the state away, we actually end up bringing it closer. And if you can't live in a way without an authority in your life that is, you know, there to control you, apart from yourself, then you're not really living. <laughs> you know, you're, you're just kind of doing your told. And this is ironic, the slave mentality that Nietzsche was so terrified of. Hmm.